Honestly, I'd like to know. Somebody tell me, how did the church get Christ? How did that happen? Why don't you stand with me, please, in John chapter 14 and verse 12. And the Bible says, Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, what that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If he shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for this passage of your word. Lord, thank you that we have your word. It is a relevant book. It is very old, but it is just as important today as it was when you inspired the writers to write these words. We are studying your words this morning. You were speaking these things as you walked this earth. And I hope that we would want very much to have your heart to know what you would want us to do. I hope that we have a desire to be just like you, to look like you, to talk like you, to love like you. Thank you for this opportunity. I pray that we'd not waste it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Dissimilar metals. Say that with me. Dissimilar metals. Now, if you've worked on vehicles at all or or you do any type of building and stuff, especially in steel, iron, aluminum, copper, there are dissimilar metals that sometimes engineers will put together, especially in motors and on vehicles. And as a mechanic, I hate dissimilar metals because what happens, over a period of time, dissimilar metals, through the elements, things, atmosphere, water, salt, dirt, those things start to change and those dissimilar metals become one. And when it comes time to take those dissimilar metals apart... Christians have been known to swear in the process. Not me now, but I'm just saying, you know. It is extremely frustrating because those two have become one, and whatever engineer decided that was a good idea should be drawn and quartered. That's just to to use a medieval term. I think that when it comes to our relationship with the Lord, you and I are dissimilar metals. Really, I am a fallen creature saved by grace. In my fallen condition, I do not represent Jesus Christ at all. He and his perfection left heaven, came down to earth, lived and died and rose again, a perfect sinless life, and he took my place. Once you and I trust Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, we recognize the price that he paid for us. We recognize that I am a fallen creature that is pathetic, deserves hell. But I see that Jesus Christ took my place on the cross. And obviously we're bringing the gospel into a nutshell here. We're condensing it. And I recognize that he did that for me. And all I need to do is put my faith and trust in him and say, Lord, I'm sorry that I'm a sinner. I believe in you as my Savior. I believe that you died and was buried and rose again three days later. And I believe you did that in my place knowing that I couldn't do anything about my sinful condition. And you did that for me. And I pray, Lord, come into my heart and be my Savior. I'm sorry. Be my Lord. Be my God. As Thomas said, my Lord and my God. And once we trust Christ as our Savior, He says He comes into us. The Holy Spirit fills us. He says He'll never leave us or forsake us. So now... I have Christ in me. The Apostle Paul says, Christ in me, the hope of glory. Okay? My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the, what's the, how's the song go? I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name, on Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. That would be my testimony. I hope that's your testimony. If you believe that, say amen. Okay, so now we are dissimilar creatures. I got a perfect God living in me, and I am a sinful creature. And you would think, that'll never work. But it does. 
And I'm going to tell you how that can happen this morning, because really in John chapter 14, what is taking place is I believe that these are relationship verses. Jesus is speaking, and he says, listen, if you do certain things, for instance, in John chapter 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. You want to show your love for Christ? Then obey him. And I'm jumping ahead of myself here, but the verses that we've read are really talking about companionship and relationship and knowing one another. And obviously, for you and I as Christians, I want to know my Savior every day. I want to know Him better than I did before. And I hope, I hope at this point in my life, I'm closer to Christ than I was even last year or the year before. Obviously, we want to be moving forward with Him. So, I'm going to give you four C's this morning that will put, if you will, what we're looking for is to, for those dissimilar metals, we want them to become one. We're not fighting that process. We want to come together with the Lord so that He and I, we are connected. And the two become one. So, number one, obviously, the Bible says in John chapter 14 and verse 12, I can do greater things than even he did. And we know what the greater things is, is the gospel message. I can share the gospel. Jesus worked in a very small area in Israel. Even now, you look at the nation of Israel on a map, it's hard to find. All those other countries that don't want to wipe Israel off the map are huge countries compared to the nation of Israel. And obviously the hate that Satan is inspiring over in that part of the world is, is ongoing. It's been that way for a long time. There will never be peace there until the Prince of Peace shows up. And I'll tell you what, if you're watching the news right now, that couldn't be far away. Okay, I'm getting a little sidetracked here, but Russia and China and Iran are making very close alliances. It was humorous to me that someone said, well, Russia and China are getting together right now, but they'll never get along. Whoever said that doesn't know their Bible. And I'm not saying they'll get along, but you know what? The enemy, my enemy, is my friends. And once they decide that Israel is the enemy, other countries will get together, not because they like each other, but because they have a common goal to get rid of someone else. And that common goal is fueled by Satan himself. And right now, while Russia and China are getting together in the news and all that's going on in Russia and Ukraine, China is watching the Russia-Ukraine thing to see how America responds to that because China wants Taiwan. And Russia and China are saying, hey, uh, you know what? China says, we'll back you, Russia. If you want Ukraine, go right ahead because we need you to back us while we go take Taiwan. And all of that stuff is going on right now. And let me tell you something. You want to read Ezekiel 38 and 39 because those folks are getting together. And there is going to be a great battle that will take place. And the Bible, I think, clearly teaches that the church of Jesus Christ will be taken out somewhere in that process. And if that's going on, I believe old Gabriel's lips are close to the trumpet. I think the door is being reached for in heaven, where the Bible says in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1, come up hither. That could be the rapture. And if it is, I don't know about you, but that's very exciting to me. But I don't want to leave anybody behind, you. And I think it's important that you and I be what we can be, the best that we can be, because time is short. And the Bible says we can do greater things than Christ did, which is astonishing to me. But the greatest thing we can do is reach a friend, reach a man, reach a woman, reach a boy, reach a girl with the message of Jesus Christ and get them to, to come on board with us by saying, Lord Jesus, be my Savior, my Lord, and my God. So we can do greater things. And to do that... It's, I believe there are four things that need to take place for us to do greater things, to be like Christ. I want to be like Christ. So number one is companionship. Read his word. Spend time with him. That's called companionship. Now, obviously, what needs to take place is this book right here shows the heart of God. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and it's profitable. I'm in numbers right now in my Bible reading. All the tribes, 12 tribes, they're all taking, going to the temple, and they're all taking the same exact sacrifice. They've got two bullocks and six rams and six ewes and six of this and four of those and one of these and this silver spoon here and this. And I'm over and over and over in numbers. Judah did it. I, 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 and your eyes glaze over, and you're thinking, 
I can remember years ago, Reader's Digest came out with a condensed version of the Bible. We thought, oh, you know, because obviously Reader's Digest was famous for their condensed books. If you're old enough to know this stuff, this was before the computer, before the internet. There was a company called Reader's Digest, okay? So, and they, had, they came out with a condensed Bible, and the Christians, we were aghast. How could you condense the Bible? And as I'm reading this, I'm thinking, I could condense this, you know? All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Now, I don't understand it all, but if the Bible says so, then I'm supposed to read through that, and God has some profit for that. And I'll tell you who's very great at teaching things like that is Chuck Swindoll. But anyway, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, profitable for doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect. Wah! <laughs> Obviously, perfect is mature. Okay, so that we can handle the circumstances of life that go on. But obviously, for us to know the heart of God, we need to know this book. Be in it every day. Every day. Say that with me. Every day. Okay, every day you be in this book, and after a while, it just starts to make sense to you. You start looking at the world and biblical thinking and all of those things. That's, that's me spending time with God Almighty, Jesus Christ, His Holy Spirit. His Spirit bears witness with my spirit. As you read this book, there's a connection that takes place that goes on. There's a connection. Companionship. Number one is companionship. Number two is you need to stay close. Nothing between my soul and the Savior, as the songwriter wrote. Stay close. Number three is to stay connected. The Bible says pray without ceasing. To stay connected is... The fact of the matter is sometimes we have a tendency to drift. How many fish? Many fishermen in here? Oh, I like to fish. I don't fish anymore. You wouldn't know it by my life, but I do like to fish. I know that a lot of times we'll get in the, when we're in the boat and we find a spot. And we're in the water and we start casting and this is our spot. And then you look, after you've done this for a little bit, you'll notice you aren't anywhere near where you started because the boat's been drifting while you're having all this fun. And then I can remember as a kid, we'd be looking down, we're going to hit the rocks. We're going to, we drifted so much, we're going to smash into the rocks. And then you try to get the motor going and it doesn't want to go. And you're working and you're rowing like crazy, trying to stay off the rocks and get back to where you were. And so we'd have to keep starting the motor to go back to where we were. And then we'd stop. It would have been helpful had we had an anchor. So to stop the drift, you have an anchor so that you don't drift. What's our anchor? I believe our anchor is love for Jesus Christ. It keeps me from whenever I see something enticing. Oh, that looks interesting. No, 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 no. We ain't going there. Okay? So watch out for the drift. We need to stay connect, uh, connected to him. I believe prayer is that process where the Bible says pray without ceasing. Is that when we talk to him... That's our connection. He speaks to us through his word. That's our commandment, uh, our companionship, and obviously to stay connected. And then there is another C, which is to stay complete. When you are first trusting Christ as your Savior, you are a work in process. Bill Gaither wrote that song, He's Still Working on Me to Make Me What I Ought to Be. It took him six days to make the moon and stars, the sun, the earth, Jupiter and Mars about how loving and patient he must be because he's still working on me, okay? That's the process that goes through, that we go through as we become complete in the Lord. And so all of those things are, if I am to look like Christ, it's not just going to happen by putting a Bible under your pillow and hoping osmosis takes place as you sleep at night. Boy, wouldn't that be slick. It doesn't work that way. There's some effort involved in being like Christ. There's some effort involved in being like Christ. Say that with me. There's some effort involved in being like Christ. And I can't emphasize that enough. We are cursed with lazy Christians. I know that's not nice to hear. I know you're supposed to build up your audience, but a relationship doesn't just happen. 
I've decided this is Relationship Sunday. Tomorrow is Valentine's Day. Ooh. It's going to be so good. Everybody has a relationship. I recognize there are those here that your, your husband or your wife are no longer with you. They've gone on to their eternal reward. Those, are, those things are heartbreaking. I know how that feels. Been there. Done that. Hope I never experience that again. But I know. But I, even if you, that loved one is no longer with you, everyone has a relationship. You've got a son. You've got a daughter. You've got a mom. You've got a dad. You've got people that need love, that need to be reached out to. Uh, if you can say, well, my husband's not here, my wife's not here, I understand, I'm sorry, but find someone tomorrow and reach out to them. Buy them some flowers, call them up on the phone, tell them it's Valentine's Day, I want you to know what, that I love you. Relationships are important, they're critical. God built us for relationships. And so, and especially husbands and wives, by golly, if you don't do something for them tomorrow, you are pathetic. That, 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 relationships require effort. You need to be doing something. So this is Relationship Sunday. Obviously, it's my encourage, I'm encouraging you to build that relationship. I believe the parallels of our relationship with God Almighty and His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus talked about in Ephesians chapter 5, I'm, and when we're talking about the bride and Christ, He said, I speak, I'm sharing a great mystery with you. Remember, last week we said, can we all agree that there's some mysteries in the Bible? One of the great mysteries is Christ in the church. Why did he bother with us? We are the church, the called out group of people, the ecclesia, okay? That's us, that's the church. And, and Jesus Christ loved the church and gave his life for it. So he chose the church as his bride, and someday we will be presented to him. And I, 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 I'm going where angels fear to tread here, but the fact is this, and we've all seen it. It's that thing that we, yeah, we all, it's, remember the, the, the blue hair ad on TV? If you've seen it, we all see it. We all see it. There's this person with blue hair at the store, and they're saying, we all see it, we all see it, and you can't help but blue. And so we, we see the obvious things, and sometimes, and this is where I'm going that I shouldn't, but I will, because you've thought it, you admit it, when I say it, we'll see a couple and think, how did he get her? That's incredible. That doesn't make sense, you know? And we've all thought it, now we, we wouldn't say it, but it, you see that. Well, honestly, I'd like to know. Somebody tell me, how did the church get Christ? How did that happen? We don't deserve him. It's incredible. But thank God we have him. Amen? Amen. So here we are this morning on Relationship Sunday. I think the parallels are exactly the same for our relationships with one another. A man and a woman are dissimilar metals. We ain't a bit alike. But over a period of time, through life, through situations, through circumstances, through the atmosphere of love or trouble, good and bad, poverty, rich, whatever your circumstances may be, over a period of time, Two become one. Now, we know in the union of marriage, the Bible teaches that two become one. But I'll tell you what, it's, it's also a process that takes place over a period of time. Honestly, couples that have been married 50, 60, if they make it to 70 years, start to look like each other. They do. Now, that doesn't say much for Emily, poor thing. You know? I'm, and I'm looking in the mirror and think, it would never be fair if Emily ever started looking like me. And of course, I'm so much older than her that it'll, it won't happen anyway. Probably for her next husband, because she's, she's, she's looking for a younger man. She's planning ahead. We were talking about, we were, we, we, this is awful. We were talking about this last night, and I says, I'm really, I'm going to make up a questionnaire for you for when I'm gone that you need to be asking these questions to the next guy. And I'm, it's very important, and I'll, I, can, I can tell you the questions, but we don't have time this morning. But, you know, if, if, if somebody else is going to have her, I'm going to say, congratulations. But there will be some work involved, okay? So, <laughs> so anyway, dissimilar metals, those two become one. In the marriage relationship, obviously it's very important that those same four things that I just said about for our relationship with Jesus Christ need to take place with our relationship between our husband and wife. Number one is companionship. Spend some time together. 
spend some time together. Boy, are, are, are we busy or what? Nowadays, husband and wife seems like they both work. Now, if you are fortunate enough to have your wife at home like I am, then thank God, but a lot of times you're both working, and I believe that Satan is using the busyness of life to divide homes. I believe Satan uses the busyness of life to make sure that you don't have time to be in God's Word. I believe the parallels are the same, that two are supposed to become one, that I want to be united with Jesus Christ in my relationship with Him, and I want to be, re- I want to be united in my relationship with my wife, and time is important, and time together is important. There should be a time every day where we're in God's Word, and there should be a time every day where you're spending time with your mate, and it isn't when you go to bed at night. That's not, that's not the time. It can't be. There are things that you need to discuss that is not really pillow talk. Pillow talk ought to be saved for pillow talk. If you want that defined, we can talk later. Okay? But the, why does everybody look at my wife when I say things like that? But the, <laughs> you got, That was cute, wasn't it? Yes, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, but obviously there are things that need to be discussed through the day, whether it's about the kids or the job or work or life or whatever, or that you would, you, companionship is so important that you spend time together talking about, I, and I've already shared with you before, and it's still true, I know what she's going to say about certain things, because it's the same thing I would say. After 20 years of being together, we are starting, we may not look alike, but we think alike. That means my thinking has changed in certain areas and her thinking has changed in certain areas. Now, the parallel is not the same with our relationship with the Lord. The Lord's thinking about us hasn't changed whatsoever because he's perfect and we are not. But my thinking about him certainly has changed for the better. So obviously, that time together in companionship, make sure there is time every day where it's not you and the kids and the wife. It's not you and the kids and the husband. It's just you and her, her and him, no one else. It is critical that that happens every day. If you say, Stan, that's just not possible in our life, then you need to fix your life. Companionship, number one. Number two, obviously, is to stay close. Nothing between my soul and the Savior. Man, can things get in between a couple? Can be money, can be finances, can be the kids, can be work, can be the dog, the cat. It can be anything. Satan will find anything to build a wedge between a relationship. Why does Satan hate a husband and wife? Because it's a picture of Christ in the church. It is our greatest witnessing tool. I don't know about you, but I don't care to have a marriage based on Kim Kardashian and Kanye West. That's not my model I'm looking for. What the world needs for a model is Mark and Sherry Arnold, happy. Alan Sheila Griffin, happy. Stan and Emily Griffin, happy. Whoever you want to fill in the blank with, the world needs to see a model of two Christian people, a man and a woman as God ordained, married and loving one another, because that's a shining light in a dark world. And Satan hates that. And he's at war against the family. And it's never been more obvious than it is today. And it's only going to get worse. I'm not going to let anything come between my wife and I. It's not going to happen. And you need to just almost take a military attitude towards that. That that's a battle line that you're not crossing. Because it's so important. So make sure that you stay close. Hold hands. I love seeing couples hold hands. You know, you don't see that very often. You don't. When you're walking into Walmart, hold hands. When you're walking into Hannaford, hold hands. Let people see you guys connected. If you're at home, kiss once in a while. I'm a believer in a kiss. I just like it. I do. Maybe this is too much information. Okay, but obviously there's stay close. You know this this touchless relationship or whatever this, that doesn't work. God made us for relationships. You know, scientists have found out they've done studies on this that you need eight to twelve meaningful touches a day. 
You know, one of the things that's killing us during COVID is the isolation in the rooms that people are staying in. People need to be touched. They need relationships. If you're not touching one another, your relationship will die. It's going to die. I'm not a prophet, but it cannot survive a touchless relationship. It's, it's so important. And obviously, you need to stay close. Nothing between my soul and the Savior. Not only we, we obviously, we've got companionship, we've got closeness. We want to stay connected, pray without ceasing. Remember, we talked about the drift. And what can happen is the drift takes place when you've not stayed close. And over a period of time, you start losing something that you don't even notice is slipping away. What, how that happens is this. I love kids. But a lot of times I see husbands, moms, and dads making a great mistake in that it's all about the kids and never about them. And they're going to soccer practice, and they're going to hockey, and they got this thing and that thing. And you look at their calendar, and they got six different things going on through the weeks from their six different kids or their six different activities. And they're constantly running and doing this and that. You know what? I'll tell you right now, your kids may not like it. But that your home is not built for the kids. Your home is built for the husband and wife, because someday the kids are going to be gone, and it'll just be the two of you, and it is not uncommon for when the kids are finally gone. And I'll tell you what I've noticed, and you, you can say, I, for a very brief period of time, I felt the pain of loss when my two oldest kids got married and moved away. Now, obviously, we had two more to replace them, and the, and the, and the story goes on, yada, yada, yada. But I was surprised, shocked, if you will, how much it hurt when those two kids got married and moved off. Wow. Well, I got married and moved away, and I looked back at my parents, and they seemed to be doing fine. Fact is, I thought they were happier than ever. I noticed my father, he's doing things. He goes and he puts in an oil-fired furnace rather than a wood boiler because nobody was there to feed that thing. And then he goes and he puts in three more restrooms in the house. We grew up with one, and now there's a bathroom in every corner in that. What was that about? <laughs> to me, it just looked like he was happier, and, he, and I think he was. But you know what? I'm wondering maybe he wasn't, and he didn't share. doesn't matter. I'll tell you this. When the kids move away, it hurts. I'm just telling you right now. If you've experienced it, you know it. If you haven't, I'm warning you. But when the kids move away and you're going through that pain, you better still be in love with one another. Because if you're not, what happens is you look at each other and you say, you know, I don't even really know you anymore. And you're both hurting. And you both decide to throw in the towel. And that's exactly what Satan was hoping for. That's the fact. You make sure that the kids don't come between you and the little woman. Between you and your husband. Because the time will come when they're not there. And that marriage needs to be built to last And it's only going to last if that never comes between the two of you. Stay connected. Don't let things drift. Your anchor is your love for one another. And lastly, stay complete. Now, there's this movie named Jerry Maguire. I don't know if you ever remember it or not. Renee Zellweger and and Tom Cruise. And they're going through, I can't, rem- I can't remember all the details of it, and I, I don't even know if I should recommend it, but there's this great line in it where he looks at her, and you guys already know what the words are, you complete me. Say that with me. You complete me. And I'll tell you what. Emily Lovett completes me. I just like her. And I wouldn't have always said that. We aren't a thing alike. I'm big and rugged and strong. and <laughs> she's, she's a female, obviously. The differences are huge. She's artistic. I can't draw a stick figure. I mean, she does all these things and makes things. She brings them to me. Do you see this? And... I'm thinking, is that a target? Do you shoot that? How do you, where, where, you know, where's the bullseye? But no, it's, she's wanting me to appreciate the, the work that she's put into these crafts and things like that. And 
oh, wow, that's really, we're not alike <laughs> at all. But I, I hope this isn't, if the day comes that I outlive her, which God forbid, I'd really miss her coming by and showing me those things and say, what do you think of this? So, you keep showing me that stuff, and I'll keep faking it, okay? <laughs> because I'll tell you what, guys, I was, and I could tell you stories on and on and on, and we're out of time, but I'll tell you this, I don't know where I'd be without my wife, and I hope every man here that has his wife thinks that. And if you don't, you need to do the four C's that I'm talking about this morning because you will think that. It's just a matter of putting the effort into the relationship because nothing happens easy. But to become one, those dissimilar metals can bond together to a point that they could never be taken apart. And that is the greatest thing. I need my Savior. For me to have my prayers answered, I need to be like him. And next week we'll talk about how we get our prayers answered. And it's all this process of two becoming one. <music>